Well, uh, thank you. I'm a little nervous um, to be here this morning with all you people for Book Expo. America. You know, I'm one of those people that, uh, believe it or not, if you see me on television, I may not look like that guy, but I'm the kind of guy that when he gets into any area, he looks for the bookstore, and he hangs around the bookstore. It's a magnet for me. I, I like to explore a bookstore. It's sort of like dating with it, somebody else. You know, you're exploring them all the time. And I like to go in and explore the recesses of bookstores. I started this in grad school at Chapel Hill, and then I fell completely in love with Carla and Barbara's politics and prose in D.C. I hope somebody's here from there. It is absolutely the number one watering spot in D.C. for not just the literate, but everybody. We all go there, hang out, drink coffee, eat apple popovers down in the basement. It looks like a grad school operation going on all the time. We love that place. And up in Nantucket, I love Mitchell's Bookstore, which is absolutely the place to go up there and hang out. I'm afraid we've lost Mimi last year, but she was great. And it was always a place to check in. And the independent bookstore is such a cultural phenomenon in this country. It's not just a place to sell books, it's a place to get lectures, to you really have an ongoing intellectual life. And it's the one place you love doing it. So congratulations for, for doing this. I read the New York Times today, the business, if it isn't booming, it's living, which is a great thing. Well, it's good to be in the Big Apple, or as it was once called and may well be again called, the Naked City. Guess that depends on who wins the mayor's race, huh? <laughs> it's going to get worse. Actually, I remember growing up with that TV show called Naked City. There are eight million stories in the Naked City. This has been one of them. Eight million people in this city, and Anthony Weiner's one of the top two. <laughs> I was thinking about Alan Helen Hunt the other day in that movie, It's As Good As It Gets, the movie with Jack Nicholson, and this woman said, why can't I just find a normal boyfriend? Is that too hard to do these days? <laughs> anyway, everybody seems to be leaving politics these days. The other day, this week, actually, Michelle Bachman, who I actually really do love, Michelle Bachman announced this week she's leaving politics. And I'm tempted to say, please, Michelle, pretty please. I've never asked you for anything. You got to think it over. The country needs you. I need you. I used to think a Congress is a place like advising consent with sophisticated people like Walter Pidgeon as the Senate Majority Leader, and the Southern grandees like Charles Lawton, and, and sophisticated older, older old money people like Margaret Chase Smith running the place. Well, today it's feeding time at the zoo. It's very different. People ask me about the old days. I think back to the days of the 1990s when we had really nice guys like Newt Gingrich running the place. Newt Gingrich was a guy who carried his own china shop around. He was a bull that carried his own china shop around with him. But luckily, we had Bill Clinton playing the matador. And I really, I never forget how he made Newt sit in the back of Air Force One. It made him pout for a month. Well, that's nothing compared to today. Today, we got Hannibal Lecter as the Senate Republican leader. He wants to eat Obama for breakfast. And in the White House, we have a guy doing Greta Garbo. I want to be left alone. Well, today, we've got nothing but endless fights over taxes and spending and government shutdowns and sequestrations and the inevitable filibuster, in fact, debates about the filibuster. And this last week, believe it or not, there was a debate about whether to debate the filibuster. Yes. Back in the 70s, I worked for the Senate Budget Committee for Senator Ed Muskie. And back then, this is how times have changed. The, the, the Republicans and the Democrats on the Senate Budget Committee agreed on a budget together, a bipartisan budget. It is real. And back, in fact, in the 60s, when we fought the Vietnam War, or fought against having the Vietnam War, even the anti-war resolutions were all bipartisan. Cooper Church, the parties got together to fight the war. Do you remember, I don't know if anybody's as old as me here, but we used to have a Republican Party up here in the Northeast that had Nelson Rockefeller, a liberal Republican as governor of New York, Clifford Case, a liberal Republican as senator from New Jersey, and the great Bill Scranton of Pennsylvania. Where are they? That's all gone. We had a United States Senate in 1964 that passed the Civil Rights Bill. Catch the vote and how it's changed today. The vote for civil rights, which opened up public accommodation, did all the stuff that John Lewis fought for. All that stuff was done by a vote of 73 to 27. The Republican vote was 27 to 6. What do you think it would be today? A dramatic change. I know one thing from this last election. What was the most popular picture of the newspapers in the last election? 
Was it the debates? Was it the conventions? No. It was the picture of the Republican governor of New Jersey walking along the beach with the Democratic president of the United States. That's what people like. That's what they want. That's what the people in this country are dying for. And I have, like you a bookseller, have a lifesaver coming out this November, Tip and the Gipper. It's about the working relationship between a very conservative president, Ronald Reagan, and a very liberal speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill. It's not, despite all the talk you hear about a cartoon about two old Irish guys sipping whiskey together. The last we need is another ethnic cartoon. Reagan didn't even drink. It's a true story of two professionals who knew their job was to do a job not to screw the country up in government shutdowns and filibusters and the rest of this Mickey Mouse stuff we have today. I had an inside track on all this because I was TIPS AA for the whole six years. The book's aimed at people who want to see it all work again. They want to see their government perform again. Don't expect it to be all schmaltz, although there's some scenes in this book. I'm turning it in Monday morning at 9. Jonathan Karp is here, Monday morning at 9. There's some schmaltz in it that you will not believe. My favorite is these two old Irish guys in a hospital, George Washington Hospital, University Hospital, and Reagan is just barely alive after being shot, and the bullet got right in his heart. He lost half his blood. It was much worse than people know. And here's these two old guys, Tip O'Neill, kneeling down next to the president's gurney, kissing him on the forehead, and then they recited the 23rd Psalm together. So it's a little different than today. There's some other great scenes. There are parties together, they're toasting of each other. I think it's great stuff, but the most important thing is they disagreed 180 and they got things done, and it worked. And I think this book is exactly well-timed to this year, because nothing is working right now.